Thank you, Rye. Thank you, Plume, for uh, being so kind to partner with us and host us, give these presentations. I'm thankful that Dr. Alex Fakeway agreed to come on to this talk as well to give another perspective on breast augmentation. We're both experts at this, but as any expert, we, we all have like our own way of approaching surgeries. And so this is kind of a twofer, right? You get two two different perspectives in one presentation and not just not just I and, and Dr. Fakeway, feel free to just jump in, you know, whenever you you want to, or I may ask kind of what what your opinion is regarding, you know, any other topics we're gonna cover today. I will say um I can't take complete credit over all of my slides. I did receive the the slides from Dr. Fakeway's breast augmentation and this is kind of a combination of both of our uh, talks. All right. So, so I'm Zara Leia. I go by my middle name, Zara. My pronouns are she, her, they. Just as a general background of my uh, surgical qualifications, I completed general surgery training in Arizona, University of Arizona, which by the way is where my daughter is actually going to medical school right now. And hopefully will someday, not far from now, will become a plastic surgeon as well. So, after completing general surgery, I went on to do craniofacial pediatric plastic surgery in Salt Lake City, Utah, and then went to LA here in California to USC to do a hand surgery and microsurgery fellowship, followed by formal plastic surgery training back in Salt Lake City, Utah. I then went on to do academics and private practice and ended up getting an offer to be trained by Dr. Toby Melcher in Arizona for gender surgery. And I practiced with him quite a long time before coming to California and joining Gender Confirmation Center. Dr. Fakeway, you wanna tell us about your, your background? Yeah, absolutely. So my name is Alex Fakeway, and my pronouns are he, him, and I'm originally from Nevada, which is where I went to medical school, and I did my residency at the Icon School of Medicine, which is part of the Mount Sinai Medical System in New York, and then when I completed my training there, I had the opportunity to go work with Lauren Schechter at Weiss Memorial Hospital. So I, that's not a, oh, I thought it's a general surgery. Yeah. So I did a gender surgery fellowship. So I spent a year just doing basically, you know, ever, everything that, you know, could be offered with gender affirming care. And then I moved out West to be closer, back closer to my family and first worked with Kaiser in Sacramento. And then about almost like five years ago now started with GCC. Thank you. So just some sort of housekeeping things. I know that Ryan mentioned some of these things. During my talk, I, I may or may not use some of these terms to refer to our community, but particularly the feminine side of our community, because this is a breast augmentation talk. So some of these terms are, are listed here. Of course, we always try to be inclusive and diverse and more in everyday life, but in our presentations as well, and make great efforts to recognize that everyone's gender journey is very, very in, in like individualized, and very personal. And it helps us at times to know what that special journey is to understand the patient's needs. So one of the things about presenting, especially when putting up pictures of like before and afters, that I will say as a disclaimer, the before and after pictures that we have are sets of pictures that our patients have given explicit permission to, to use for educational purposes, such as our website or in these situations where we're giving educational presentations. But sometimes we were reminded that, you know, we're only showing pictures of young people or white people and, you know, where are the people of color? And so to a certain degree, we can't completely control who gives us permission to use pictures, but we are trying to strive to ask, but also encourage people of color to, to give us permission to include photos for these types of educational events. All right, so let's get started with the topic of breast augmentation. So in general, of course, even in in our trans femme community, there is such a wide variation, just as much as there is with the cis feminine population in terms of breast anatomy, shape, contour, and things like that. And so 
Some of the things that in general tend to apply to our patients is that there tends to be smaller development of the breast tissue. The nipple areola complex tends to be on the smaller side in terms of diameter. The lower pole, which is the lower half of the breast, tends to be a little more restricted, shorter. And the fold, the breast fold, tends to be higher as compared to the cis femme population. Again, that's a very generic generalized trait. The pectoralis major tends to be on the larger side as well as the chests that we work with tend to be on the larger side. And so these, all of these things come into consideration when performing breast surgery on our patients. Now, many of our patients, not all of them, and of course you don't have to be, just like Rai had mentioned at the beginning of the talk, not everybody needs surgery, nor not everybody needs hormone therapy either. So, but those who are on hormone therapy, specifically estradiol variations, plus or minus antiandrogens, plus or minus progesterone, will have an effect on the breast growth. And again, it is variable for everybody. And so it could be dose dependent. And the one thing I put an asterisk on the line that says dose dependent and something to remind our, commu our community to follow follow your your hormone provider's prescription and treatment so that you don't overdo the hormones because there are potentially negative and significantly neg negative side effects of being on too much hormone medications and so just follow the the instructions but certainly it seems like if you take more your breasts will grow more but again there's a safety sort of window for that kind of thing again listen to your hormone provider now even on the right therapy and levels of estradiol plus or minus progesterone which is touted to potentially again not on everybody potentially add to breast growth it probably maxes out in a year or two there are I guess anecdotal cases, or descriptions where after three, four, five years, all of a sudden, I guess the switch turns on and there's very good growth of the breast, but I'd say that is pretty fair. But usually about, I'd say two years, the breast development and growth tends to max out. I don't particularly have any kind of requirement in terms of how long you've been on, on hormones before performing breast augmentation. Do you, Dr. Feigway? I don't either. I explain to people exactly what you described with the caveat that I don't prescribe hormones. So I can't speak from, you know, personal clinical experience about what an individual could possibly expect from taking them in terms of breast growth. So what I explain is that if it is going to happen, that having um, a larger breast with more expanded skin can translate to, you know, being able to have a different size implant. If somebody wants to go, you know, like on the larger side, they might have less issues with having parts of their breast constricted due to lack of skin. So there is a benefit to kind of like maxing out your breast growth with hormones prior to having the implants, but acknowledging that, you know, not everyone's going to be on them. Uh, what I, you know, that it's not a requirement. When I work with people, I don't do a strict timeline. I just ask them if they think that they are still experiencing breast growth in a subjective sense. And if they say that they are, then I explain what I just did. And if they say that they are not, you know, then I kind of also explain that and then move forward. So. Hey, thank you. So breast screening for cancer specifically is an important part of the evaluation and leading up to surgery. And I think that family history is probably the strongest indication to have patients go to their primary care physician, not so much me as a surgeon, for following the standard guidelines for all women for breast cancer screening. You know, that may involve not just family history and which relatives in particular have had cancer, but also possibly genetic DNA testing for certain genes like the BRCA gene. And so that's consideration and the, the family history of breast cancer is part of the 
kind of the intake evaluation for this. And of course, you know, we do examine your, your breasts as part of the, the workup process. And of course, we are feeling not just for the characteristics of, you know, from the surgery standpoint, but also looking for masses and enlarged lymph nodes that may be suspicious and indicate to us that you may need further testing, screening, workup, et cetera. There's a classification for all breast growth, and it's really just kind of a guideline. You know, it's just something to, to take into consideration, again, with what Dr. Fakeway said, you know, because it does affect ultimately what size we're dealing with or what kind of physical restrictions, such as the restriction of the lower pole or the lack of skin. And so we just take a note of it in our exam. You may not call it out when you're in the office, but these are things that we take note of, as well as some of these things. I have like a diagram. Yeah. On, on the last slide, I always like to point out that the Tanner stages was developed in cisgender individuals. And so while we use it, we apply it towards people who are, you know, taking hormones and their, their breast growth, it wasn't, you know, designed for that. So like exactly as you said, that it's something that we kind of like have to document or it's like the best ish language that we have to like use to describe breasts in a way that other clinicians will understand. It's not like exactly applicable. And so it's, you know, kind of like not surprising that people's, you know, breasts that we work with might have, you know, kind of different features than, than this. And I was going to comment, I forgot to say regarding the hormones that we might not have a requirement for it, but it is true that some insurances, you know, based on prior WPATH standards of care will want to have documented year of of hormones. I know that that's come up before, hopefully less, you know, as the standards of care change, but some insurances are still kind of like behind on, on what's more like modern. That's true. And I tell patients because patients are like, well, why, why do I need two letters or why do I need one year and things like that? And unfortunately I, I, I say, you know, insurance is paying for it. So you kind of have to check off, check off those items in order to have them covered. Otherwise, you know, surgery is expensive out of pocket, especially if you don't need to. So other measurements and things that we take into consideration is certain measurements, characteristics of each individual chest and breasts in terms of degree of asymmetry, in terms of position of the nipples, position of the folds, position of the nipples things like that. And the only one that really kind of stands out to me that I make, I guess, an extra effort to to point out is if someone's triple areola complexes are really far apart, I tell the patients that after augmentation, they will likely still have nipples that are still on the farther apart position, but only if it's kind of an extreme thing, a little more I guess, far apart than uh, our usual trans feminine chest. Now, there are different surgical approaches to breast augmentation. There's some general type of approaches. So implant-based is probably the most common way of enhancing breasts. And this involves implants, whether they are silicone or saline. And there's different, I'll go into the different types of uh, implants. You can also do it through fat grafting, thus avoiding having any kind of foreign material, such as an implant, and having to worry or think about everything that goes with having an implant, which again, I will go through that down the, down the talk here. One other one that I actually have never done, Dr. Faye, we can chime in on this, is staging breast augmentation, especially if someone wants a certain size that may be too large for them at the time of their first surgery, is to place a, a tissue expander, a breast tissue expander, to kind of help the body stretch out that skin in order to allow for a larger implant. I have not done that. I know that some centers will do that on specific cases. A, my approach to someone who wants larger breasts than they can, that I think they can have at the first surgery or at the current surgery, whichever stage they're at, is to simply wait six months and then come back and switch out the implants for a larger size. By then, the, the skin will have stretched. It will have most likely settled quite well in order to 
basically go up to the next size. Have you done any of the staged approaches, Dr. Figway? I have not. I have, you know, a lot of history from that, from my training, which was very heavy in, in breast reconstruction for those that had cancer. But I do have a lot of experience with expanders and then replacing them with permanent prosthetics. I've talked with some patients about it, but it's kind of challenging and the people that we work with since a minority come from, you know, nearby and with the tissue expansion method, it's significantly more complex and from the patient's perspective, because they need to, you know, have a visit with doctor's office every like one to two weeks to get their expander filled. And so finding the kind of the right candidate, someone that's like nearby and, you know, kind of meets these needs of like the implant size and like wants to undergo it has not panned out. I was actually supposed to do one last month, but then the surgery had to be canceled and postponed. So should be one, but coming up, but it's just really, it's not easy to find somebody that's, you know, like a good candidate for it. So I do exactly as you described with most people, I just talk about, call it like a slow expander, you know, slow expansion process. And you go kind of like halfway there and then see how they feel um, and then can do, you know, more accordingly if, if they if they want that. Great. All right. So the next seg- segment has to do with the technique of using implants for breast augmentation. Just going over my particular approach to breast augmentation. And by the way, these these things that I will point out has been applicable not just to gender surgery, but before at one point in my career, I, I wasn't a gender surgeon. And so I was doing breast augmentations on cis femme people. And so it has not changed. My approach is still the same. And so for me, and then I'll have Dr. Figway follow with his particular approach or considerations. But I have always, always put the implants under the muscle you can go above and below. I'll have a, a slide explaining that. I have only ever used smooth round breast implants for cosmetic breast augmentation in my entire career, actually. And in terms of breast incisions, I do offer the periareolar approach, which at some point was the majority. Now I have actually switched in the last couple of years to the more common way of doing it. I think in surgeons, probably here in the U.S., if not all over the world, is just to make the incision along the projected inframammary mold. And one thing to also point out, and I think I have another slide, is that breast augmentation can be combined with other gender-affirming procedures, such as face, body contouring, or bottom surgery. So you certainly can choose to do it as an isolated angle procedure, or as me or Dr. Fagway or anybody else that, that as a uh, gender surgical care provider to combine it with any of the other affirming procedures you want to have. Now, implant size, for me anyway, I mainly base it on projected breast width. And that was one of the measurements in that other diagram. Sure, I look at all the other all the other characteristics, but that's the, the one that helps me guide not just myself as a surgeon, but also the patient as to what their range is. And so anyone who's consulted with me, I will talk about everybody depending on their on their chest exam and characteristics and width as a range of implants that will fit their chest appropriately and hopefully meet their their goal size. And so there isn't like, okay, I see someone, I look at everything, I measure it, and I'm like, you have or you need a 340, sorry, the train's passing by. You need, uh, you know, you can only have a 340 cc implant and that's it. Everything else is, is wrong or bad. It's not like that. So everybody has a range and within that range, I usually ask the patient, do you want to be on the lower side of the range, sort of right in the middle or on the higher side? And of course, because I use a sizer during the procedure, which is basically a saline implant that has a tube attached to it, I am able to basically control the volume of it. And once I make the pocket, it does two things for me is that it allows me to see that my pocket is appropriate position, but also in contour. And it also tells me what size I will ultimately place on the on the patient. And sometimes it is the, the, the desired volume that the patient wants based on like the rice test or what their wishes are. But sometimes it's a little bit different, again, taking into consideration what their preference was for low, mid, or high sort of volume within their 
projected size based on all the things I said before. And so that's always been the case, again, with both cis and uh, trans femme patients when I've done breast augmentation with implants. Alex? Alex is out right now. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> For a couple of days, but he'll be out. Uh, okay, fine. My way is the only way. <laughs> Not Alex. Just kidding. All right. So again, incision-wise, I still offer periareolar, which is right along the lower half of the, the dark circle, which is the areola. And one of the common questions that people will ask me about that approach is, does it affect nipple sensation? I have to say that it has been maybe one or two patients that reported having prolonged decreased sensation of the nipple after breast augmentation. One person was still kind of numbish after a year, at least that I know of, but in general, having done it this way for seven years, very few people had issues with numbness of the areola. It tends to hide pretty well because it's right at that junction of the dark areola pigmented skin versus the, the breast skin outside of the areola complex. Now the inframammary fold again is within, I'd say, you know, hopefully within a half inch of where the projected new inframammary fold is. And it's not that big like it is in this diagram. That's just showing what the fold is, but it tends to be about five centimeters in width. And that's what I measure when I mark the patients. And I try to stick to that and not widen it or even go maybe a little bit smaller depending on the size of the chest and the size of the implant I'm considering putting in, but probably never smaller than four centimeters. The transaxillary approach is a form that I used to do back in the day. Um, I'm much older than Dr. Fakeway, but back in the day, silicone implants weren't available when I was doing my training. And so because the saline implants come deflate it, right? All the silicone implants that we use now are pre-filled, but the saline implants come empty. And so you could literally roll it up into a little taquito and then slip it through uh, the armpit and into the chest. And you can join that with or aid that process with an endoscope, which allows you to see certainly the medial and inferior border of your of your so of your pocket under the muscle to ensure that you are adequately creating that pocket, which is one of the sort of potential negatives of doing it through the transaxillary approach is that, um, you know, if, if anything isn't quite right with that technique is the positioning only because of the access to, to be able to create an adequate space. But I no longer do or offer the transaxillary approach. I certainly would consider it if someone wanted saline implants, but I have to say that it's been a long time since someone's asked for a saline implant. I think I've only done one, no, two. I've done two cases, certainly within gender surgery, and I've been in this for almost 10 years. So basically, periareolar incision or inframammary fold. Implant placement, like I said, I've always, always put them under the muscle, but the other potential placement for the implant is subglandular, which means above the muscle and underneath the breast tissue. And of course, when you put it under the muscle, there's certain sort of degrees of like how much muscle coverage is over it. And that's what this other diagram is showing. As you can tell from that diagram, because the pectoralis major muscle is kind of a triangular or, or like a stretched out trapezoid type of shape, it doesn't provide full coverage of the implant, but certainly you can cover quite a bit of it. And there's plus and minuses regarding that. While you were away, Dr. Fakeway, I was going over my particular, I'll go back up so you can sort of have a reference of what I, I, I spoke about. I, I talked about my specific approach to breast augmentation, which has been pretty constant and consistent in my career anyway, in terms of the basic approaches. Like I always put under the muscle, like I've never actually put it over the muscle ever for breast augmentation. So things like that. Can you talk to our audience about your, sort of your specific preferences and approaches to your way of doing breast augmentation? Yeah. So I go through with the individuals that I work with and kind of lay out what the different options are and kind of relate those options to risks and benefits, especially in terms of capsular contracture. 
And I kind of laugh to myself when I do that because I think it's important. And of course, that's the way that I offer surgery is like a, a risk benefit discussion for everything. And then we decide a plan together. But ultimately, like 99% of people pick the same thing, which is, you know, what you said, which is an, an implant underneath the muscle. And for me with an IMF incision earlier in my career, I was doing more subglandular, which is above the muscle placement. And I think that there's this kind of a select group that that can be ben beneficial in and I have done periareolar, but I do that most commonly in the circumstance of someone with a tuberous breast, which is a specific type of breast anatomy that the, in my training, kind of the best way to correct that shape and to make it into a more, you know, kind of like common anatomic shape is to do a, what's called a periareolar mastopexy at the same time as doing the, the augmentation. So, so there's kind of like rare circumstances that I'll do other or if in part of, you know, or I'll, that I'll direct, you know, an individual to kind of like one versus the other, but then, you know, otherwise, as I'm going through it, I, I just try to talk about the, the risk and the benefits of the different approaches. I don't do transaxillary. And I, I, so I refused to do that because it wasn't a part of my training. I did like two in residency. And I think with like the risk profile, it's just not something I'm like, there are people that do it a lot. And that's what I tell if someone really wants it and they come to me, you know, I don't have like a name to refer them to, but I say that there are people that do it more commonly and you should have that person do your surgery because like, I don't, I just don't do it. Thank you. Yeah. All right. So some of the things about over and under, but I think in general, not just the two of us, but in general, most, I, I would say most plastic surgeons do place the implants under the muscle. And some of the, I, I suppose, uh, traits that go along with that is that there's better vascularized tissue covering most of the implant, again, not the entire implant, most of the implant. And that might play a little, you know, play a little role in why under the muscle tends to have less risk of contracture, capsular contracture. There's also thicker tissue coverage because you're including the thickness of the of the muscle. Because it's under the muscle, that whole sort of upper pole gets elevated as a unit rather than under the the under the breast tissue, the subglandular, where if it's someone who's very thin, you might end up getting kind of a more sort of a fake boob type of look where you can really see the the outline of the superior edge of the implant. But one of the potential downsides is animation of the breast when you tighten your pectoralis major muscle. We do detach the muscle partially, but you know, whenever you do certain arm movements and whatnot, the muscle does activate and contract. And so it can push the implants in a downward and outward direction. And I don't think in general, that's a, that's a problem, but for some, it can be pretty marked and they can sort of do that party trick of making their, their, their boob stance. But I actually don't see it that often where it, it is an actual problem, the animation. I have seen it also in over the, over the muscle, under the breast tissue, where they do have animation. So that's why I put less risk of animation. It doesn't like completely eliminate it as, as a potential. But I think the biggest reason for me not to put it over is the risk, what I think is still current that the risk of capsular contracture is higher. Uh, it's, okay, so the surgery itself is done under general anesthesia. I know that there are folks that do it under IV sedation. I personally don't, but under the right circumstances, you know, I have seen it. I participated in it certainly during my, my training where it was done that way with an anesthesiologist present and, and you know, it's safe in those situations. But it's outpatient, of course, unless you combine it with other procedures. I say overall the recovery just for, I mean, not complete recovery, but the recovery after two weeks. By two weeks, you're doing pretty well. I, I, I personally have my patients do breast massage, and it's mainly pressing the implants close together because I do cut part of the muscle, not just underneath, but also along the the sternum, breastbone down the middle. Of course, not all the way, but if you know, I have my patients push the implants towards the middle to sort of maintain the cleavage that I have created and not allow that muscle that I cut to basically stick back down and heal. And then you end up with breast implants that are too 
maybe they don't look bad, but they're too far apart for the ideal cleavage for the patient. And so uh, there are different types of breast implant shapes. Like I said earlier before, I have only put smooth round implants for breast augmentation. I have not used textured implants for breast augmentation, but just like Dr. Thickway, you know, in my previous life, I also did a lot of breast reconstruction for, for cancer patients. And so I did use the different shapes, including textured and shaped implants. But for breast augmentation, even back then, like I said, for breast augmentation and cysts or trans patients, I've always used smooth round implants. Alex? Yep, exactly. So once the kind of correlation or the established, uh, you know, risk of breast implant associated cancer, which I'm sure, you know, is, is coming towards the end of this came about with textured implants. I just don't offer them. And there's different, maybe there it's coming up in slides, but there's kind of like different rationales. One of the things I point out was a study that came out when I was in residency where they took and there's cis individuals that had breast augmentation for either cancer or for cosmetic purposes. And they showed their pictures to a group of like lay people and a group of, group of plastic surgeons. And they said, you know, please tell us which is a round implant and which is a teardrop implant. And neither group could accurately tell which was which. And so it, you know, seems that even though, you know, it kind of gets like marketed, like, oh, it's this natural shape. Look, this is what a breast looks like when a round implant is in the chest and it's kind of like, you know, compressed down by the muscle, it seems that the differences become neg negligible and then certainly not enough to, you know, warrant kind of the increased risk of having like an implant malposition if that shaped implant like rotates, you know, or the, or the rare, but, you know, possible chance of getting cancer associated with those textured. So it's, it's all round for me. Yeah, same here. Round smooth implants. Of course, even within the round smooth implant category, depending on the particular brand manufacturer of these implants, they all have like a wide variety of options that have different types of profiles. And so this is just an example, no particular brand, but Modern Projection, Modern Plus, as you can see, you know, these these may be the same volume, but they're just different different profiles. So high, extra high, or, or one of the brands calls them ultra. And so I, in general, use Modder Plus, and only in certain circumstances will I use either a moderate, which is not very common, or a higher profile implant. I've never used the ultra or the extra high they tend to be very narrow and very projected, and I don't feel like it fits the aesthetic of most of my patients, cis or trans. But Modern Plus is probably the most common profile I use. Yeah, second that. So these are just some examples. These are, I don't know, I actually don't have too many before and, and afters, but this is a middle-aged patient who had breast augmentation. Oh, my picture got cut off. I'm sorry about that. But that's an example, a younger patient with a thinner chest. Looks like that. All right, so that kind of covers implant-based breast augmentation. Again, the most common way of doing it. I think... Certainly more recently and a more emerging technique is fat transfer breast augmentation. And what that means is that you have no implant, so you don't have to worry about all the things that go along with implants. And you use your own fatty tissue that is harvested through liposuction to enhance the size and shape of the breast. And so it's certainly a more natural way of, of doing it. It is permanent, but to a certain degree, because lip liposuction and fat transfer isn't always 100%. So basically what that means is that once the fat is processed from the liposuction into injectable fat graft, any part of the body, there's always some degree of loss in the, in the transfer process. But once it takes, it's basically permanent so long as you maintain your your weight, but just like any fat cell in your body, if you gain weight, you you know, you could gain weight in the areas where you had fat graft. And if you lose weight, you certainly will lose weight from everywhere in your body. So uh, that's fat, fat transfer. There is the biggest limitation. Well, there's several limitations, but very thin people, very 
then women simply many, many of the times don't have enough fatty tissue in their body to be able to harvest a significant amount of usable fat graft to inject and enhance their their breast significantly. So I have done it in patients who are very thin that are really opposed to breast implants and they get a very, very subtle, modest increase in it. But another thing to remember, especially in thin patients, is that again, once you harvest as much as you can, you process it and you have the portion that is usable, you have to play, like split it in half, right? So you go from a small amount to even a smaller amount per breast to augment. So I think that is a limitation, unfortunately, for the thinner patients. The other thing too is I think that regardless of the of the size of the of the existing breast, sometimes breasts just like any woman has different characteristics. So it can be very fibrous. And so for patients who have very fibrous basically very dense breast tissue. I find that it is incredibly hard sometimes to actually not just pass the the needle through which I do the, the fat transfer through. It's just hard to pierce that tissue in order to inject. And even if I pierce that tissue, um, I have a hard time squeezing the, the, the syringe, the plunger, to get the fat to distribute adequately. But, sorry. So those are some of the challenges, is the fibrous breast tissue and thinner patients. They're less ideal, I think, for this type of augment. But certainly patients with larger breasts and less dense fibrous breasts can be very good candidates. This is Dr. Fakeway's patient, and you can see that there is a modest but noticeable increase in the breast in the breast volume there. I already mentioned the pl the pluses and minuses of back transfer. There are different types of systems. I won't go over it. There's, you know, there's these are commercial machines or, or equipment used to do it. And so we use several systems. Uh, the point of it is that, that they are closed systems, meaning that, you know, we're not like taking the fat with our hands and trying to like filter it through, like, you know, it's it's all like a built-in system. And so the whole thought is that, you know, the less you mess with the fat as you process it, the, the better chances of a higher survival rate. And that's what we use. And there's different ways of injecting it. Hand, <clears throat> hand injection, again, without having to actually touch the fat directly, even though we are wearing sterile gloves. Or direct injection through the machine after suctioning and processing the fat. Okay. So anything you want to add to fat transfer before I go into general risks of implant-based breast augmentation? Yeah, I think just reiterate that, you know, when I talk with people about it, I say that it's a helpful adjunct rather than a primary reconstruction method. So meaning that it helps in the appearance of when you've had other procedures already, rather than something that someone can get like a reliable result from with just doing just fat transfer alone. So I think if you already have like in the circumstance that you've maybe had an implant in and then you want to remove the implant and try to replace it with fat and you've already kind of like made a little bit of breast shape with that prior implant, then I think you have the kind of the best chance of doing that. It's still going to look kind of like the picture that was like shown because you're, the fat isn't like sturdy enough to kind of like hold the shape like an implant does. That's another thing that I counsel people about, you know, and if you don't have, you know, more of that kind of like developed breast on your chest, if you try to fat graft it, there's like no, in my, you know, opinion, there's like no reason why the fat's going to like mold itself into something that looks like a breast. It's just going to be like fat that kind of like goes like in, you know, in a general sense, kind of like around the chest. So I think that it's, uh, you know, not for, you know, something to do like alone, and, you know, I'll, unless you have kind of like set expectations and it's like, you know, an implant is an absolute deal breaker and, you know, you want to do fat and you understand that, you know, you'll at least for the benefit of not having an implant, you'll get, you know, maybe like 30% of kind of like what you're looking for, like maybe like 50% of what you're looking for, you know, they can be like an okay trade-off, but for most people it's, it's not,
Yeah. So, uh, okay. So with the implant base now going into the potential risks and complications of having breast augmentation. Now, before I go into this, some of the common questions I get for from patients is, do I need to switch them out every 10 years? And that used to be like the old... I guess, rumored or accepted way of doing things in the past. Um, and I actually don't know where that 10-year thing came from. It was it was well before my time. But nowadays, I tell patients, you know, you could, you could safely keep them in, you know, 15, maybe stretch it out to 20 years. But my recommendation is after about 15 years, you should probably think about switching them out. They don't exactly last forever. And the other reason, if you think about just the time span, 15, 20 years later, I I hope that the implants are much better in 15, 20 years. And maybe the rate of capsular contracture or rupture or the type of uh, silicone material gets improved. And maybe some of the risks are less because it, the obviously the knowledge and the technology is much better, you know, 15, 20 years ahead of us. So that's a common uh, common question. It doesn't have to be every 10, 10 years. So 15, I'd say 20 is stretching it. Anyway, so potential complications. And I do go over this in the consultation. I certainly at least sort of quickly run over it. Of course, our paperwork reflects like more detail as to what these things are, but and I'll go over these individually or most of them. Implant rupture in general, the rate of the most up-to-date silicone implants is, you know, just depends on the brand and the study, but 6 to 8% risk of rupture of the implant. Capsular contracture, anywhere from 8 to 12% is a possibility. Now, I think clinically, I have to say that I see it, unless they just don't come back to me or let my office know, regardless of which office I've been that I actually see it in much less than what these numbers are. And some of these come from like the FDA studies of when they first got the implants back into the the market along, you know, it's been a while now. So anyway, so that's implant rupture, capsule contracture, breast implant illness, I'll go over a certain type of cancer, not breast cancer, to be clear. It's a certain type of lymphoma that can happen or squamous cell carcinoma, which is another type of cancer. And of course, sort of the generic risk of any surgery is bleeding and infection. But infection in terms of cosmetic breast augmentation, which is what this is, is very, very low, 1% of infection. Having said that, I will say that I have had one patient that had one, maybe two patients that had a, a significant infection to the point where I had to take out the implant. And in those cases, I give them six months with no implant, which of course is not ideal. But then I am able to go back and place an implant and they do okay without further infection. And of course, bleeding, again, very generic. That can happen, but I would say that that is extremely rare to have to take someone back to surgery after a breast augmentation due to bleeding and a big collection of blood in the chest. Now position, which usually leads to some sort of asymmetry in the breast, can happen, not necessarily because of some big, bad, uh, you know, complication, but sometimes tissues settle differently or it heals differently. And, you know, there's some malposition and asymmetry that needs to be addressed with a revision. And that has certainly happened, but again, it's it's not very common. This is, okay, so implant rupture, like I said, about six, six to 8%, but in reality, clinically, I see it, I don't see it very much, whether I did their breast surgery or someone else comes in saying that they have a ruptured implant and want me to take care of it. Obviously, the solution is to take out the ruptured implant and place a new one in there. Of course, saline implants, when they rupture, it's easy to to figure that out because it's just saline. It's the same type of fluid that is given to anyone who has an IV if you end up in like the hospital setting. And so if it ruptures, the saline leaks out, and of course, the body absorbs it and you pee it out. And of course, the breast deflates usually within you know, 24, 48 hours or so, one side is flat versus the other. Whereas with silicone, especially modern silicone, which is a gel and they're cohesive, meaning they kind of hold their shape even if they, if they rupture, it can be a bit harder to 
figure out if it's ruptured, more than likely the shape might change or the feel of it might change. And it's something that you have to get worked up. And so this is just a, I got this from the internet, an example of a ruptured implant on the left side over here. And they call it the linguini sign because it looks like there's a piece of linguini in the breast tissue, which signifies that the, the deflated broken capsule. So again, the treatment is remove it, the current implants you know it's not like syrupy silicone which i haven't seen in a very very long time but that's a pain to deal with you know back in my earlier years when someone came in that had implants from a long long time ago and they're ruptured and it's just goo all over the place and into the tissues and things like that all right capsular contracture capsular contracture again i also don't see it that often in uh, in my patients and so it's one of those things that has a risk of like i said eight to twelve percent risk of it happening and what that is is that the capsule that forms around your your breast implant, that's a normal thing. It's a normal response of our bodies to encapsulate a foreign object, which in this case is a medical device. But that capsule should stay nice and thin and supple and soft and not cause any kind of problems. But if for some reason it reacts to something, most people think there's some sort of subclinical infection of the capsule, meaning that you don't know that, oh my gosh, I have an infection you know, your, your breast is swollen and red, not like that. Subclinical, where you don't really know, maybe microscopic, it seeds a capsule. And over time, the body reacts to it and the capsule starts to thicken and it starts to contract. That's why it's called capsular contraction, right? Just like it says. And so it starts getting thick and it starts squeezing it. So the breast will start feeling firm. And then it'll start to misshapen as it basically starts to ball up, as you can see from the from the diagram. And there's different like staging system or grading of the of the capsular contracture, but it can get to the point where it is quite painful and very obviously deformed in patients. And so that's one of those things where, of course, you need surgery to fix as well. And the way to fix it. This is an example of it. The way to treat it is to take out the implant, which by the way, it usually isn't ruptured just by being squished like that. It could be, I suppose, but it usually isn't. But either way, even if it's not ruptured, you know, put the same one back in there. You take out or we take out, you know, all of the capsule as much as we can of the of the capsule, the old bad capsule, and then basically put a new implant in there and allow the body to basically reset or start the process all over again. But once someone has had capsular contracture, they get treated, the risk of them having it a second time almost doubles. And again, clinically, for those that I have had to fix, it is very rare to see it develop again. Unless, of course, you know, our, a lot of our patients come from elsewhere. They end up getting it again and they go somewhere locally to have it taken care of or they don't notify my office. But that's capsular contraction. That's kind of a classic example of kind of what it looks like. Now, cancer. So again, not breast cancer. So breast implants themselves don't cause breast cancer, but they do cause different types of cancer. This is one that is very rare. I have to say that I've never seen a case of this or had a patient suspect that they have this, but it's something called breast implant associated. That's what the BIA means. And a plastic large cell lymphoma, a lot of big words. So it's a type of cancer. And of course, like cancer, it needs to be treated as cancer and have people die from it. Yes, of course, it's cancer. And I think as of maybe a few years ago, I guess reported cases in the world has been probably under 2000 cases at this point. Dr. Fakeley, maybe it's pretty rare. Um, it tends to be associated with textured implants and the causes are, I mean, kind of largely unknown, but they think that it has to do with, again, maybe subclinical infection and the body's reaction to it. And for a while, they also thought that, you know, like why, why textured, textured implants versus smooth implants? And they thought maybe it had to do with like the, the, the way the manufacturing process goes to make the shells textured. Oftentimes they use salt to make that texture. And of course you wash it away and the salt melts away. 
but I, I don't really know that anybody really, really knows. But that's something that has to be considered, certainly, as a potential risk. It tends to happen not right away. On average, is usually it presents eight to 10 years later as kind of a larger slushy sort of breast, meaning, you know, it seems like all of a sudden you have swelling and there's fluid in, in inside of your breast. And you're like, what the heck? Like, what is this? I don't have a saline implant. You know, what's going on? And so that's the kind of thing where if anyone came in with any sort of fluid, it, I mean, for me anyway, it doesn't matter how long it's been. I would certainly be, you know, my alarms would go off and be like, hey, this could be cancer. I would I would send the fluid to pathology to get analyzed to make sure that I'm not missing or that I don't have a case of this in front of me. And yes, it is treatable. You know, it's cancer. But again, people people have unfortunately died from it. The risk, I don't know, it's very vague because it's very rare. One in 3,000 to 30,000. It's a wide range. So it's something to keep in mind. And I, I, I'll go over like what to do in terms of long-term sort of self-examination and awareness of your of your own breasts. Another really rare breast implant related potential cancer squamous cell carcinoma. And this one happens to affect both smooth and textured implants. And so the presentation is pretty similar, but I guess it, it takes even longer for this to even show up. And when it does, it, again, it could be it could be like the fluid collection, but it could also be um, a lump or mass or something like that. Breast implant illness, this is also something I bring up. It's kind of a vague set of symptoms. There's a lot of symptoms related to this. I once saw a list and there were like 80 some different symptoms related to this. It's I think it's thought of as basically a form of potentially autoimmune type of reaction to the silicone. And ultimately, I mean, it's a diagnosis of exclusion, meaning like you figure out whatever the symptom or set of symptoms might be and try to fit it into known sort of syndromes or sets of, you know, diseases, conditions that can cause that maybe try to treat them and they don't go away. But that's what diagnosis of exclusion is. And ultimately, what do you do with that? You take them out. You take out the implants and see if the symptoms go away. And sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. So it's it's still very vague. I have not seen a single patient that has come to me, again, regardless of whether I did their surgery or someone else did their surgery, come in worried that they have breast implant illness or even remotely has said things along that line. So, but it is out there and it is a condition to be aware of when considering breast augmentation with implants. Implant malposition, you know, a lot of different ways that can present the implants too high, too low, too far apart, too close together, but beyond what is considered a normal variant of, of natural breasts. And of course, depending on which condition it is, there's ways to to fix it. But those can happen. Also pretty rare for that to happen. Has, has it happened to some of my patients? Of course, I do have to go back and, and fix it. And when I do, I usually put an absorbable mesh to help basically prevent it from going back into that same position with good success. So, but again, something to, to consider when looking at this. Now, ultimately, if you choose to have anything, actually, breast augmentation with implants or even with fat, you ha you know, you now have breasts and real breast tissue. And so it's one of those things that, you know, in the shower, if you notice some sort of lump, don't ignore it. You know, if you, not just on the breast, but also on your armpit. Of course, lymph nodes in the armpits can, can develop because you have a cut on your hand or, or your arm or scrape or something. But if it's persistent, that should go away. But if it's persistent or seems to be growing, don't don't ignore it. Go to your PCP or even your surgeon, which of course we would tell you to go see your, your general practitioner to figure out what's going on. So don't don't ignore it. There are official recommendations as to follow up, certainly by the manufacturers, which are tied with the whole FDA approval of the of the implants, is getting an MRI, I guess, five years after having it implanted in you and follow up every three years. It's kind of the recommendation. There are ways to also get mammograms. Again, you have breast tissue now, so getting a mammogram with an implant is not a problem. There is a specific protocol that they follow for women with breast implants. And, and that's about it, really. 
I'm going to just add that they, they recently approved or a few years ago approved ultrasound as in place of MRI for screening for implant rupture. I don't see that many. Do you see a lot of ruptures, contraction, rupture in your practice? I'm a wildly superstitious individual, so I don't even want to answer that question. But, <laughs> uh, no, I do not. Yeah, I don't see that many. You know, thankfully, because it's hard to treat. So, I mean, rupture is not hard to treat, but, you know, caps or contracture is, so. Yeah, but yeah, so those are things, I think overall, okay, I, I know I, I spent a lot of time talking about potential complications, and some of those items are pretty scary, like cancer, right? Like, you know, it, Cancer is scary and it's life threatening. And so, but overall, I, I have to say that breast augmentation with implants is is very, very safe. There's at least a quarter million, you know, breast augmentations done each year in the US alone. And so there's a lot of a lot of breast augmentations. Again, overall it is very it is very safe, but of course you have to not go into it blindly and you have to know that there are real risks potential even if they can be extremely rare because it happened to someone, right? It doesn't matter if I quote you one in you know two billion, if you happen to be the one person, it's a hundred percent to you. So it's just something to to consider. I'm pretty open about my own experience. I'm a trans woman. I've been through a lot in terms of everything, but in terms of my gender journey and my own personal transition with numerous surgeries, which for some reason they, they don't stop. <laughs> I'm having surgery soon for something I won't say, but, but anyway, I had capsular contracture, horrible, absolutely horrible, stage four or grade four capsular contracture. And I think after five after five surgeries to over a course of like two years, having, you know, cadaver skin in me, pig skin, mesh on the one breast, I finally, finally got better. And I check myself all the time now because sometimes I'm like, oh, did it come back? Because I'm waiting for that double risk, right? I said, once you have it, you, you, you have double the risk. So I'm pretty aware of my own breast, but I wouldn't, you know, again, personal, I, I, if I could go back, I would still do it. I would still have breast augmentation. You know, I love my breasts. It's a big part of my identity, my personal journey. And so, you know, but it was tough and I'm human. And just because I'm a surgeon, I don't get a pass from getting complications on bottom surgery or, or a top surgery. So, but I got through it. It was, a, it was, it was a lot. And uh, yeah, anyway, so sometimes I joke, I'm part zombie, part bacon and part android because of the mesh so you know it is what it is oh my goodness <laughs> what an end to this talk <laughs> great great ending thank you dr lay <laughs> you know it's a reality right surgery yeah. serious. surgery is a big thing and risks are real and so you know i've been through it and so i think it's you know i still think it's very safe and for those that unfortunately have it and, and, you know, like you'll be okay, you know, go to the right team, get it fixed, be patient. And it can be done, you know, it can be, you know, treated and get back to, you know, quote unquote normal, you know, so it's just one of those things. Yeah. And thank you so much for just like sharing your personal story too. I feel like that is really important for people who are thinking about surgery or, or looking for surgery. I think just like having people who've gone through it before in like any capacity, if it's gone really well for somebody, if there's just complications, I think like it just makes the experience just a lot more like humanized and like nuanced and complex, you know? And yeah, I just really appreciate the fact that like, not only are you like a surgeon who does these surgeries, but you've also experienced these surgeries too and also like unfortunately have gone through the ringer but are also like on the other end now too so that is really beautiful like thank you so much for like the depth of your knowledge and like your wisdom that you bring to the table now and to like the world to be able to share something like this so thank you both Dr. Fakeway and Dr. Lee for that yeah thank you thank you for listening
Yeah, of course. We have a little bit of time for Q and A's. How's your energy levels, Dr. Lei, Dr. Pickway? I'm okay. Dr. So a lot of the questions got answered just through the presentation, but I will start with this first one because it is highly uploaded. How do you think surgery actress is going to be affected? The currently new elected person promises to ban trans care. <laughs> yeah. Dr. Lay, take that one. <laughs> We have no idea, honestly. My, I don't know. This is a, I mean, it's a hard subject to to talk about, and all of it is speculation. But you know, given the the pattern and where things were going, not just not in the current administration, but in the previous administration, which is now again the new administration, and the fact that they used us as pawns you know, especially, you know, my community, you know, for fear mongering and, and stuff like that. It just seems like they're just going to try to restrict more, more and more access to gender care, not just in youth, but also in adults now. And that was already a thing where they were trying to to restrict it to a certain age, even though you're, you're you know, 18 and older, but they may I don't know. They they may try to outlaw it completely or something, but I, I just don't really know. I just hope that there's enough processes, checks and balances. Hopefully, hopefully the Democrats still win the House. And then there's some way to sort of like fight back. I, I mean, it's hard to say. It's exactly as you're saying, like we have no idea to know what's going to happen. I think you know, the fact that we're practicing in California which will, and San Francisco, which will be, it's like a sanctuary city and a sanctuary state that it would be, you know, unlikely that they would be able to keep us from practicing this here. But it might restrict access in other states that have, you know, different laws in place. And then, you know, of course, then it's, there's lots of other kind of concerns you can think about that for that. But, you know, for the time being, I think what is important to reassure everyone is that we, you know, are practicing, nothing has changed, nothing, you know, will change. You know, we are at your disposal as your providers. Yeah. And not just in California, again, we are a, kind of a sanctuary state. So people who don't have access, you know, seek out not just California, but other places. And I realize that not everybody can just plan a trip to San Francisco or to, you know, some of these other states where they have protected gender care. But yeah, there's, you know, we're, we're here if you can get to us uh, and if not get to the nearest place that you're able to, to get the care that, that you need. Yeah. Thanks for being real. Really appreciate that. This person asked, they said that they are clinically overweight and are currently losing weight. How much will being overweight impact the surgery process and results and how much will losing weight over the next year impact the consultation slash pre-surgery process? I don't really have a weight limit for breast augmentation, but in terms of losing weight, it does change the contour of the of the breast because most of breast tissue is fatty tissue. And so if you lose a lot of weight, your breast will have a more sort of deflated and more tautic, meaning more droopy appearance to it. And of course, depending on the situation, if you have you know, maybe a large implant because, you know, you were a, a size larger when you had it done, but then you lose a significant amount of weight, you may end up with a very droopy breast over a adequately projected implant, right? Because the implant doesn't lose weight. So you may end up with a situation where you need a a breast lift in order to restore the appearance and contour of your of your breast on your new body mm -hmm. for sure thank you are there any procedures that exist to enlarge the areola well there's tattooing which is not exactly what this person is asking but they can work to enlarge it and i think in a fair amount of individuals the if an implant is placed, it stretches the skin, which includes the areola. And so you can see some areolar widening after breast augmentation has been performed. I don't think that this is necessarily like a given, and I don't have any medical studies that kind of like point to this, but I have, you know, seen it in individuals that I've, you know, personally worked with. 
Great, thank you. This person asked, in your opinion, which procedure would be considered best practice for augmentation? Would it be like adipose tissue or the saline implants? What do you think generally has better results? I think that that's on a kind of like per person basis. It's, kind of, you know, that the procedure can go into like a number of different ways in which is performed the, you know, implant characteristics, the incision that's used, the placement above or below the muscle, you know, or even conversely, you know, doing autologous fat transfer. And so I don't think that in a general sense, I personally wouldn't be able to answer that the right, you know, choice for the best result for any individual kind of like depends on their personal, you know, anatomy and preferences and risk profile. So, you know, it's, you know, could really be one or the other. Like I said, I, I don't personally think that there's, if we take all that into account, there's less people that, you know, are candidates to get what they want with autologous fat transfer. But in the way that I discuss it with people, like I said, if, you know, if it meets enough of your goals by not having an implant and you're okay with, you know, whatever we kind of predict is your degree of change, you know, if, if that kind of like trade-off balances out for you, you know, then that's a great approach for you. Whereas it might not be a great approach for someone else because they might be looking for, you know, something different, say like more size, a different shape, you know, and then the fat's not necessarily going to provide that. So, you know, there's a potential, any one of those types of procedures could be like the best for any individual. For sure. Yeah. Um, very individualized. Great. Thank you. We are running up on time right now. So I would just ask one last question. So sorry for the folks whose questions weren't able to be answered. I will send this list of questions to folks over at the GCC and hopefully we can get some responses within the next couple of weeks. So just want to know that these answers are not gonna go unanswered it's just gonna take a little bit for it to get back to you but the one that I saw that people had uploaded to was this person said I've heard that below muscle implants can help avoid any nipple sensation loss is that true or is there still a risk for nipple nerve sensation loss yeah unfortunately still risks depending on you know or I had that slide about the different types of placement that we call them like dual plane, like one, two, three. So the implant could be partially under, you know, the breast gland, partially under the muscle. And so, you know, in that case, there could, you know, potentially be disruption of the nerves that are there. There's a procedure that we sometimes use where we make cuts in the breast tissue in order to help it expand and round out. When that's done, it has a risk of decreasing sensation. Just the sheer stretch on the nerve from the implant itself can decrease a nipple sensation. And so that's why you could still experience it with a submuscular placement. Typically in that case with nerves that are stretched and not cut, you will get, you know, regain that sensation in like three to six weeks. But yeah, unfortunately, it's kind of like anything in medicine. Like you can't say that you'll completely eliminate, you know, a risk with something. It can just kind of like, you know, lower it. Totally. Yeah, so it's not just nipple sensation. It can potentially also be a breast sensation, so not the nipple itself. And so that's, again, a possibility. And like Dr. Fegwe says, it, it, nothing is ever like a guarantee or, you know, 100% never going to happen type of situation. So I, I have seen patients who have not complete breast numbness, but maybe partial or segments of the breast not recover full sensation, but not to the point where it affects the overall satisfaction with the technique. It's just one of those things, but it is very, very rare to see that.